Welcome back to Secrets in the Cutscenes of MGS5. I'm your host, Joran Lee. Please consider backing the channel on Patreon, liking, and subscribing below. With that, let's dive in. We'll pick back up with the cutscenes in Mission 6, Where Do the Bees Sleep? But first, we need to mention something not exactly in a cutscene, but still crucial and easily missable all the same. It's the ACC radio calls. You'll get these on occasion as you return to the Aerial Command Center, Snake's office space, so to speak, running this new kind of business, Diamond Docks. Unlike the cutscenes, these are only obtainable the first time through. But just like the cutscenes, sometimes these little calls can let on quite a lot. Remember my theory that Miller, after arriving on Mother Base and before seeing you again in person, undergoes parasite therapy? And that this explains how his eyes gradually change over the game from yellowish to opaque like code talkers? Well, this first missable radio call in the ACC might just be a major clue. Listen closely. Doesn't Miller sound a bit under the weather? Boss, I know you haven't been back long, but I prepared a list of missions for you. Open your eye droid. I've taken the job offers Diamond Dogs has received and made a list of those I want you to consider. Which ones you accept is your call. The objectives of the missions I've added are prisoner rescue, facility sabotage, and high-value target elimination. Probably all a walk in the park for you, but they should help you get back on your feet. I bring this up also to showcase just how much attention that we have to keep paying to the little details in the Phantom Paint. Now, moving on. Miller gives you three warm-up operations to start off slow. In a nice little detail, the order he names them is actually an inversion of the order they're listed as. The objectives of the missions I've added are prisoner rescue, facility sabotage, and high value target elimination. Always remember the motif for MGSV of mirrors, reversals, and inversions going forward. Because the next major cutscene, like I said, happens when we will come face to face with our own dark duplicate, Skullface, during Mission 6. That mission, Where Do The Bees Sleep?, is really worth unpacking while we're here. And we may have to unpack more of the Phantom Pain's missions as this series goes on. Where Do The Bees Sleep?, just by its title, poses itself as a sort of riddle. This is rather layered and inside, so forgive me if it all sounds a little strange. But Where Do The Bees Sleep?, I claim, is a phrase latent with secret, subtle, multiple interpretations, with several possible meanings. But to answer the most literal, obvious possible meaning, let's turn to the site Buzz About Bees. Quote, Where do bees sleep? In honeybees, it all depends on their role within a colony. Research found that foragers, the older bees, sleep towards the perimeter or edge of a nest or hive, whereas younger worker bees sleep inside cells, closer to the center of the nest." End quote. For decades, it's remained something of a mystery why it is that bees, a species known for their productivity, in the words of BBC Earth, waste up to a third of the day resting and even dreaming. End quote. The BBC, the very same BBC, by the way, where George Orwell once worked, continues thusly, quote, It was in 1983 that a researcher called Walter Kaiser made a new discovery. Honeybees slept. As he watched through his observation hive, Kaiser noted how a bee's legs would first start to flex, bringing its head to the floor. Its antenna would stop moving. In some cases, a bee would fall over sideways, as if intoxicated by tiredness. Many bees held each other's legs as they slept. 
Kaiser's study was the first record of sleep in an invertebrate. But it was far from the last. The scuttle of cockroaches, the flutter of fruit flies, and the rhythmic undulations of jellyfishes all have temporary periods of quiescence." End quote. So to begin with, we have the relevance of how the fact that bee sleep at all was first discovered by modern science a year prior to the setting of the Phantom Pain in 1983. But here's another layer to this. We know by the end of the game, our protagonist, Venom Snake, is actually not the real big boss. The idea he ever was, was in fact something he essentially dreamed. Dreamed with the help, of course, of the real big boss's colony, as it were. Don't tell me you're thinking of making an imitation of the boss. I don't want any part of it. I see. I didn't mean to offend you. In reality, AI is more likely to evolve in the opposite direction anyway. The opposite direction? What does that mean? More and more, AI are becoming systems that specialize in mass information processing without human intelligence, thought, or emotion. A machine that has no individualism or sense of self, but rather behaves as a collective exhibiting the qualities of a society. Like a beehive. Yes. It aggregates data collected by individuals and determines how the collective will act, just as honeybees travel between the hive and flowers. The key to achieving that will be networking AI together. I don't know how to say this, but that kind of gives me the creeps. But if your goal is to control society, it's the better model to use. It lets you filter data. Disseminate only what you want disseminated. Of course, I myself have no interest in an AI without a shred of life to it. Peace Walker first introduced the theme of MSF and Big Boss's organization being a kind of beehive. Of all societies and societal structures as a kind of hive. The new plan is a hex type. That gives it more surface area than previous types and also makes it easier to plan expansions. We're going to make this place huge. Hex, huh? Like a beehive. Nothing wrong with that. They say the honeycomb design is one of the strongest. I hear they're even thinking of using it in tank armor. Good enough for me. I'll see about finding us some worker bees. Appreciate it, boss. By the way, Kaz, who do you think's our queen bee? Good question. I was thinking maybe Poss. Hmm. I was thinking Strangelove. Well, I can see that. Or maybe Cecile. On second thought, I might go with Amanda. How about this snake? We'll have an army of queen bees. Back in Cyprus, arguably, we found a beehive-like shape pattern decorating the floor outside Snake's hospital room. And as we see in the beehive or tholos tombs of antiquity, also on the island, some of the earliest human communal structures, not only in Cyprus, but all over the world, share a similar shape with the beehive as well. Bees. Bees? Beads. Beads? Job's not on board. It should also be noted, are remarkable little dancers and communicators. Much of the study of language as a biologically predicated trait has used the humble bee for their vector. And much later on in this game, it will be none other than Code Talker, who again will raise this idea of mother base as a collective, as a hive. Crucially, as the BBC explained, discovering bees' sleep was just the first of many new insights into the insect and later microbial worlds. Here we might also keep in mind other important discoveries and shifts in science throughout this era referenced by the Phantom Pain. Going not only from the real Sahelanthropus, but also the huge shifts brought on after the discovery of Archaea in the late 70s. I try not to do this too much, but let's quickly quote Wikipedia on this point. Quote, In 1977, Carl Woese and George E. Fox experimentally disproved the universally held hypothesis about the basic structure of the tree of life. Woese and Fox discovered a kind of microbial life, which they called the Archaea bacteria. They reported that the Archaea bacteria comprised a third kingdom of life as distinct from bacteria as plants and animals. Having defined Archaea as a new Ur-Kingdom, 
which were neither bacteria nor eukaryotes, Woese redrew the taxonomic tree. His three-domain system, based on phylogenetic relationships rather than obvious morphological similarities, divided life into 23 main divisions, incorporated within three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. End quote. More on archaea and microbiology will have to wait until we meet Code Talker. Bzzz. We'll see who brings in more honey. Bzzz. Where do the bees sleep could also imply where do the bees dream? Where do they go when they dream, in other words, while sleeping? This in turn can't help but bring to my mind the original title for the novella by Philip K. Dick used as the basis for the iconic sci-fi film from 1981, Blade Runner. It was Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Venom Snake, like I already said, winds up all along being basically a dreaming invalid, a hollowed husk of a man, whose gramophone mind merely loops slogans and words that parasitically invaded it from other altogether unknowable entities only dimly referred to in the game with ready-made labels like Big Boss or Cypher. We are, to some extent, as we always wind up in MGS games, specimens inside some macabre if not grand experiment. This time around, it seems to be a precursor to the kind of experiment we'll be returning to by the events of Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty. You could say I've made another snake. Major, I'm not talking about the children. A mental copy. His phantom, if you like. Endeavoring to create a mental copy of Snake seems to pose the following question. Can any man be shaped into the mental copy of Big Boss, the most legendary soldier of the 20th century? Even if the real Jack, the original Snake, is willing to go turncoat and become the man who sold the world, in other words, will that world buy the lie he's selling? All these questions, and their surreal, almost dream logic tether connecting to the riddle of the sleeping bees, has to remain at the forefront of our minds as we finally turn to that most Draculaic of nemeses, the insectoid-like skull face. Part of the Mujahideen's arsenal against the Soviets is secretly supplied by the CIA. But the war continues to drag on with neither side gaining the advantage. Now though, the CIA have started supplying the guerrillas with a new weapon. We don't know the details, but rumor has it that it could turn the tide of the war. The Soviets have heard about it, and it has them spooked. Now the Hamid Mujahideen were issued this weapon, but then they were wiped out in no time. There's no trace of fighting at their fort and all their supplies are just sitting there. Naturally, that screams biochemical weapons, but the Soviets deny using anything that would violate the BWC. Whatever happened, the Soviets have invaded the area and are searching for this Western weapon tech. This is the CIA's worst nightmare. If that weapon falls into Soviet hands, it'll drastically rewrite the history that's being made here. But the company can't be seen entering the area. That's where we come in. Boss, head to the fort of Dismasi Laman. Find the weapon before the Soviets, and bring it back to base fast. The new weapon is codenamed Honeybee. To the U.S., it's a vital military secret. Put simply, the Soviet-Afghan War of the 1980s has certain aspects that will forever be lost to history. It epitomizes, perhaps, the idea that there are no facts, only interpretations. Chief among these lost facts? whether or not either side violated international law by using the form of WMD known as chemical weapons. Chemical warfare, first deployed during World War I, made a big comeback, you might say, in the 1980s. Particularly fond of things like sarin gas was Iraqi dictator and ally of America and Great Britain, Saddam Hussein. Officially, the change of partners had never happened. Oceania was at war with Eurasia. Therefore, Oceania had always been at war with Eurasia. The 
The enemy of the moment always represented absolute evil, and it followed that any past or future agreement with him was impossible. The frightening thing, he reflected for the ten thousandth time, the frightening thing was that it might all be true. If the party could thrust its hand into the past and say of this or that event, it never happened, that surely was more terrifying than mere torture and death. Meanwhile, during the late 70s, a mysterious pathogen began to spread worldwide. Today we know it simply as the H1N1 variant of the common seasonal flu. Clearly, some things, as Skullface himself says, can't be undone. The source of this disease? Well, it's unknown, but one prevailing interpretation pins blame on an Eastern Bloc biolab, either from China or Russia. It's possible H1N1, in other words, originated in a lab as a man-made WMD. Something that's obviously important, here. Just as no one can state as fact what truly caused the H1N1 pandemic, neither can we be sure whether chemical warfare went on in the Afghan wilderness. The irony here is palpable. The only evidence ever offered has largely come from, shall we say, enhanced interrogations. Here's an article from the Christian Science Monitor, dated September 10th, 1982. Note how it does not mention how the following information was obtained. Quote, Another Soviet soldier captured by Afghan guerrillas has said that occupying Soviet troops have used lethal chemical agents. According to his account, tape recorded by guerrillas and supplied to reporters, two types of chemicals caused a dense yellow cloud that were about 30% lethal. A third agent was 100% lethal. The soldier's testimony provides additional but extremely valuable oral evidence in the alleged use of chemical warfare by Moscow. Other Soviets captured by the guerrillas have referred to the presence of chemical and biological agents in Afghanistan. The soldier claims to have been taught chemical warfare in Kabul. He also says a Soviet helicopter pilot once ordered him to don a gas mask during an attack on a guerrilla camp. At least one Russian prisoner and several Afghan army defectors interviewed by Western journalists have maintained they were deployed in areas where chemicals were sprayed. But Western and neutral analysts still lack the necessary tangible proof to put the clincher on the chemical warfare controversy, namely a canister bomb or aerial spray tank used for such purposes. End quote. Clearly, the topic of chemical warfare relative to this Afghan-Soviet war is very relevant for the Phantom Pain. And as we'll see in later episodes, it will also have continued relevance for the story of how the U.S. will replace the USSR as the great, if faltering, military power fighting in the Middle East. If you're wondering what any of this has to do with how we opened, with bees, consider the following tape of Code Talker. It appears I was looking at things wrong. What do you mean? All of you. Until now, I had thought of your organization, Diamond Dogs, as a superorganism. Uh, you'll have to explain that one. The term refers to a unit of eusocial insects like ants or bees. While made up of many individuals, they behave as though they are one organism, with the queen as their nerve center. The closed ties you share here reminded me of that. Well, the boss's efforts do pull us all together. I was not finished. I'm speaking in terms of homogeneity. You come from all walks of life, do you not? Many races and tongues, talents and pasts complementing each other, influencing each other, making Diamond Dogs the unique group that it is. Of course. We have no use for mindless drones around here. Is that so? Then perhaps an organization like yours is a truer superorganism than the ants and bees. 
The hive-like superorganism, if you will, that the 80s will give birth to will be called American-led globalization. The draining Afghan war will help cripple and ultimately bleed the Soviet Union dry, a fitting metaphor given the role petropolitics played and continues to play still even now in the 21st century and its modern era of global affairs. I'll close this section simply by quoting the journal Post-Soviet Affairs and its 2013 article, Oil Fueled the Soviet Invasion of Afghanistan. Quote, No serious analysis of the 9-11 attacks and the United States' subsequent war on terror can be considered complete without reference to the Soviet-Afghan conflict. End quote. The tectonic shifts in science at the end of the 20th century we mentioned earlier they coincided with no less historic changes to the fabric of the global order. Though seemingly unrelated, they are, to some degree, connected. These seemingly disconnected, unrelated topics, it turns out, become themselves the kind of diverse yet interlinked cells within one large hive Code Talker describes. Perhaps this describes, to some degree, all of history. Trying to bring into view the full expanse of Metal Gear Solid V's hive and its many clusters of meaning is the basic thrust of our entire project here, deciphering the Phantom Pain. Building up Mother Base is the first step to achieving our goal. If that means wet work, so be it. We're gonna have to get our hands dirty. I hope you're rested up, because we're not stopping. Not until the pain is gone. The future of Diamond Dogs is in your hands. We're counting on you, boss. Where Do the Bees Sleep is assigned to Diamond Dogs by none other than Snake's old enemy and former outfit, the CIA. In a major mirror-like reversal, while the previous title, Peace Walker, saw Snake and Miller working exclusively against both superpowers, East and West, in The Phantom Pain, Diamond Dogs, bereft of any just cause, any greater good, merely work for whoever's hiring. As the briefing explains, in recent weeks, the entire Pashtun Mujahideen battalion stationed at Dasmase Fort mysteriously and ominously disappeared. Now, one of the recurring leap motifs of Orwell's 1984 was the act of vaporization. The party of Big Brother do not merely erase or destroy people, places, things, and ideas, they turn them to vapor. This was the ultimate embodiment of the modus operandi of a new kind of warfare and security state popularized by World War II. A secret state, a secret war, where soldiers wearing unidentifiable uniforms and secret police tortured, stalked, and kidnapped without a trace. The lines dividing military outfit and organized crime slightly blurred if not all but disappeared by the end of the war. And nobody is a better poster face for this concept of vaporization and the secret black underworld than the non-entity that is, after all, Skullface. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The Mujahideen at Smase Fort were vaporized. The only question is, by what? Intriguingly, this very same troop of Afghan guerrillas had only just recently been given the dubious gift of the CIA's brand new secret weapon, the Honey Bee homing missile. It seems here a more fitting word might not be the English one, gift, but the German word, which means, in an ironic twist of language, poison. Venom. It's a big hint that the Mujahideen at Smase Fort were given this missile, ultimately, by the very people who vaporized them only days or weeks after. Not the CIA itself, but the black hole behind it, XOF and Skullface, ostensibly the current masters of the super-secret entity known only as Cypher. Well, on this point, things become complicated. Think of it this way, for convenience sake. No. I have not forgotten what you said. However, well, forgive me for asking, but this is you I am speaking to, isn't it, Cypher? Cypher is nothing more than the world's user administrator account. It's to this account, you might say, Skullface has the password. But he's not the only one. 
It's heavily implied that throughout the events of the game, there also exists a kind of second cipher, a second faction, capable of seizing control of the authority that name signifies. This faction is the AI faction, led de facto by Donald Anderson, aka Sigint, and the neural network proxy AIs he built as one of the last orders given to him by Major Zero. Exactly which cipher is the relevant cipher at which point in the story is by design relatively impossible to say for sure. The philosophers of today have no sense of good or evil. Their influence extends to countries and organizations involved in every aspect of every war. They have become war itself. That's how they operate. The sacrifices of war cause a shift in the times. This shift leads to renewed conflict and in turn triggers the next war. Like a nuclear chain reaction, each conflict sparks countless others, forming an endless spiral that will continue on for eternity. Do you understand what I'm saying, Snake? By consuming me and you, the philosophers intend to keep that cycle going forever. Another visual metaphor here might be that Cypher was once a living, striding, vertebral behemoth, now becoming nothing more than a rotting corpse. Skullface and the AIs, the Patriots, are mere parasites who live by feasting on ciphers, not to mention big bosses, and all the world they together sold, remains. We'll learn later that this entire scenario, from the poisonous honeybee gift, to the disappearance of the Mujahideen, it was all part of Skullface's first field test for his vocal cord parasites. Let's revisit Code Talker's explanation on this point now. Both the Pashto and Tajik languages are spoken in the mountains of Afghanistan, and population density is low. Ideal testing grounds for how accurately the parasites target only the specified language. It is also relatively easy to prevent the spread of infection. And the results? The first test, I am told, was a success. Once the Pashtun Mujahideen were infected with the Pashto strain, they were all but wiped out. The Hamid fighters is my safe fort. It was doubly successful. No Tajik Mujahideen or Soviet soldiers became symptomatic. So the parasites are why the Pashtun Mujahideen got wiped out. That means the entire mission scenario, with its artificial deadline when the Soviets will recover the secret weapon, it was all instigated by Skullface himself. That seems to explain why he's waiting for you, right on time, as you move to exfiltrate the fortress. This was all a setup. A setup for this very confrontation. With all this in mind, it's clear we need to pay special attention to everything we see and hear during Where Did the Bees Sleep? Because to one extent or another, we're experiencing a show put on for us, passing a test written for us, all by our very worst enemy, Skullface, who appears at the end of this scene in, for lack of a better word, the flesh. Beforehand, though, if we hang back and observe the Soviets with their Mujahideen prisoner, we find a clear-cut nod to the torture practice made infamous in Guantanamo and other CIA black sites after the 9-11 attacks of 2001, waterboarding. The sight of the CIA's worst enemy, the Soviet Union, fighting the very same enemy, Afghans, using the very same tactics, torture, and special forces operations, all favored by the more recent Afghan occupation forces, the USA, it's all clearly meant to leave the modern player's head spinning as the past, present, and future seem to turn in on themselves, leaving us in a kind of temporal, spatial vertigo. The nature of the twin wars in Afghanistan, fought by the Soviet Union first and America last, and how they so perfectly, even hauntingly, mirror and correspond with each other. It's all a big reason why the Phantom Pain takes place during this place and time. 
But all of that context, most of that background, fades into mist, quite literally it turns out, as we make our way to the end. We recover the honeybee from inside a hive-like cave complex. We move alongside ancient ruins, fossils of a long-dead past. The various rocks in the central chamber almost resemble the skulls along an evolutionary chain, growing with each new entry larger, more terrifying, more ornate. With the antique gaslit lighting and run-down environments, not for the last time, the Phantom Pain gives the impression it's taking us backwards in time. These catacombs could be the outposts of the British Army, who tried on three separate occasions in the 19th century to defeat the Afghans in open combat and guerrilla warfare. The Soviets caught in the proxy war here are to some degree stand-ins for the Tsarist Russians, who found themselves drawn into exactly the same regions and battlefields in that same era of the 19th century, during what was known then infamously as Britain's and Russia's very own proto-Cold War, the Great Game. But all that history, all those possible interpretations, like the party in Orwell's novel with history with a capital H, gets swept away. And in its place, the palatial ruins become a wash in mist. It's worth noting that Mission 6 is not the first appearance of the honeybee. We saw it earlier during the very opening, laid out on the same table that the MSX will be when we see this same or similar mirrored scene play out at the very end. And initially during this final scene, we'll catch a glimpse early on of nothing on the table at all. Are these all from the same scene? Or are they some Orwellian double-think composite, a clustered hive derived from multiple individual moments in Snake's memory as a strange kind of collective? Whatever the truth, one thing's made here repeatedly clear. History, any concept of linear time, has in the Phantom Pain's version of our history stopped. We've got futuristic technology present in this game that's set, after all, in the past. We've got the same war on the same battlefields, waging even as the individual belligerents change hands and the years turn to decades to centuries. History not only has stopped, it's been all but devoured. Inside the whale that ate it, Venom Snake, our Arbiter, and our Pinocchio, a shadow artificed into the shape of a man. Now what happens next is a very subtle piece of visual storytelling. An oblivious snake gets captured by a giant, unknowable force. A hand, practically the hand of God, grasps him tight, closing its grip easily around him like the vices of a prison cell. When Snake next awakens, we are reminded subtly of the prologue, awakening, and how many times during it he also woke up abruptly like this. Except as the camera begins to pan and rotate, we realize we've been had by one of the oldest ruses known to man, the optical illusion. This visually conveys the idea that for human meaning, things are always relative. You need a context to know which way is up, in other words. What looked to be Snake standing upright was in fact a mirrored inversion, a flip of the truth. Actually, we were hanging upside down, still held close in the hand of an angry god like a sinner held over the pit of hell. It is then and only then our formidable, ever exciting antagonist, Skullface, finally makes his appearance. It's his first face-to-face -face with us, technically, of the entire series. Let's take a super close-up look at that conversation now. But first, notice this. The camera style for this entire scene returns us to that scene in the prologue.
It's a subtle hint anytime this specific camera mode is engaged that most likely the third boy is not only nearby, he may actively in fact be linked with our minds. There's even the possibility that the POV in scenes like these is actually from the perspective of Tretej Rebinok himself. Think of the opening of 1998's Ocarina of Time for comparison. Could the third boy be the Phantom Pain's equivalent to Navi, the fairy from Legend of Zelda? Could he, in other words, be mentally present at times, times even when physically not there? Behind the camera, just as Navi was in that opening shot. It's a question we'll be entertaining a lot as time goes on. Note also, in this sequence, the Telltale flies. These signal the presence, of course, of the Skulls, Skullface's other private army, his version, to some degree, of the Special Forces unit we'll later know and love as Foxhound. One hint I think is here to suggest we're seeing things with the third boy as our medium is how the camera swivels around Snake's back. It's almost as if we, as the POV of the third boy, got attached to Snake, shifting into a portrait of Snake's perspective as a double of that of the boys. We might call this Double Think. Next comes the second big clue to this point. The third boy floats by, breathing loudly, yet Snake remains evidently oblivious to him. This establishes that sometimes we, whoever we are or whose perspective we inhabit, can see things that Venom Snake can't. Yet sometimes, undeniably as in the prologue, we are absolutely seeing outside Venom Snake's point of view. I submit the third boy is the missing link between these two perspectives, the inside and the out. He's the conduit, subjectively, that allows such communication and transmission of multiple perspectives in the first place. Of course, it could just be that, like any typical video game, most of the time the perspective or mode of the camera is simply neutral, portraying things as they actually happen, rarely becoming stylized for purely aesthetic purposes. I could rest easy with this interpretation if this were any other game. But any deeper probing into the inner mysteries of Psychomantis and the camera style of this game will all have to wait. Because next something happens that suggests the third boy in this scene could in fact be a hallucination. That in other words, maybe those other things we're seeing that Snake can't, we're seeing because they aren't actually real because we're inhabiting the point of view of an unreliable narrator. Maybe we are never in the Phantom Pain seeing things from an objective point of view, just as the quote by Friedrich Nietzsche that ends the game hints. It so happens that Nietzsche, the philosopher, is closely associated with the perspective known as, well, perspectivism. And it's a perspective this quote does well to convey. Perspectivism holds nothing can be understood on its own by humans except secondhand by way of our all too human analogies, metaphors, and interpretations. Things we impose and drape upon it. I could go into this at length how MGS5 conveys Nietzsche's perspectivism using the most subversive genre possible, the forensic investigation crime story. Skullface at the end of the day is our equivalent, after all, of the criminal mastermind, the fox we hounds spend the entire game sniffing out. But crucially, the blackness of Skullface's well is unending. It has no bottom, merely as a chamber of endless echoes. And speaking of echoes, it might be worth mentioning here a certain musical motif that occurs when the third boy appears, both here and in other places too. This is subtle, but the sound you're hearing is technically a kind of feedback loop. Naomi, 
I just had some kind of hallucination. Is it from the nanomachines? No, Snake. The nanomachines are functioning properly. So what was it? It must have been psychometric interference coming from Psychomantis, Foxhound's psychic. Think of it as a mental feedback loop. So that was Mantis. Anyone who remembers Psychomantis from MGS1 should realize the significance of this. In that game, Mantis' powers were compared to, you guessed it, a feedback loop. A feedback loop we could also compare, if we were feeling really fanciful, to the ages-old symbol, the Ouroboro, the Snake Eater. But whatever interpretation we apply to it, there's no question it's a feedback loop in this scene. It's possible this is a musical hint that we're being visited, so to speak, inside our, or Venom's, mind by the third boy, later to be named Psychomantis. But let's table these assumptions and theories and move on. If we consider how the camera moves in this scene, it's kind of peculiar. We keep resetting the shot, coming up on the same scene anew in little vignettes punctuated by blackouts, certainly a stylistic callback to the opening of the game. What's interesting is how, when we lay these different shots over each other, they suggest, if not outright betray, contradictions. For example, does the giant sandy-handed King Kong beyond our sight draw Snake into the air or hold him firmly upside down? Are these snippets from the same event or several? Looked at closely, the chronology of this sequence we might call a synecdoche, the perfect part signifying the wider whole that is the rest of the Phantom Pain. It's elliptical, a literary word meaning lots of pauses, lots of disjuncts in the narrative flow, almost like little memory holes born into the fabric of the story itself. In such a surreal and multi-layered game, it's hard to know when to take any of it literally or at face value and it's precisely his face for a moment we can't see. Why does MGS5 consistently utilize this visual conceit with Skullface? Surely to emphasize his facelessness, but I think it goes further. Going back to Ground Zeroes, we almost never saw this character full on face to face. Instead, what we got were gliding shots along his profile, up his arm or around his body. We got a slumped head, obscured by his giant hat. At first, you might be forgiven for thinking this is all just about crafting suspense. After all, Skullface's visage is, well, his signature feature. It's the quintessence of his identity. And yet, I suspect more about this camera style may be lurking beneath the surface. There are several moments throughout the MGS5 saga where it almost seems as if Skullface's face has been imbued with some sort of secret power. This guy was so, so weird. I know I saw his face, I, I just, I can't remember it. You hope hatred might someday replace the pain, but it never goes away. It makes a man hideous inside and out. Whatever the case, it certainly seems gazing at him directly in the flesh is hideous and terrorizing to the point of being painful. The visual layout of shots like these suggests a the kind of repressed memory, the cyclical nature of trauma. We don't want to remember his face. His face is one of many details dropped down our proverbial memory hole. As you'd expect, American and other Western human rights organizations aren't allowed anywhere near the place. What happens there disappears down the memory hole. Similar slits existed in thousands or tens of thousands throughout the building, not only in every room, but at short intervals in every corridor. For some reason they were nicknamed memory holes. When one knew that any document was due for destruction, or even when one saw a scrap of waste paper lying about, it was an automatic action to lift the flap of the nearest memory hole and drop it in, whereupon it would be whirled away on a current of warm air to the enormous furnaces which were hidden somewhere in the recesses of the building. 
Yet, it haunts us. We can't help but keep returning to this same scene in slightly different ways over and over again. When Skullface emerges out from the milky mist, it's strictly beneath the neckline. We're confronted both by his haunting, disarmingly calm voice and the lack of his face, but also by the most prominent of his features framed here by the camera lens, his XOF pin. Skullface moves directly towards us, the camera closing in on the pin. It haunts us with its perfect mirrored duplicity, its reversal of our beloved cult object, the unit FOX patch, Snake's worn ever since 1964, perhaps as a memento for all he's lost. But on Skullface's body, flipped in an orientation with the original, not unlike Venom Snake's inverted relationship with the real big boss, the pin takes on new, dark meanings. Skullface will make his return soon after this scene, when we'll try to extract a certain Soviet scientist looking to defect, giving us shades of 1964. But that and much else, including the conclusion of this scene, we'll just have to wait until next time, boss.